Good day viewers, thank you very much for joining me today and today we're going to be talking about the Northrop Flying Wings and their cancellation. So if you'd been in the vicinity of the White House in February 1949 um, and if you'd looked out of the window you probably would have had your ears assaulted by a really loud noise, probably one of the loudest noises you've ever heard in your life. And if you'd looked up into the sky you'd have seen a gigantic six-engined propeller aircraft flying over you. This aircraft was, of course, the now famous Convair B-36. Accompanying it was something that looked a bit like a flying boomerang. And if you'd looked a bit closer, what you'd have seen was something that looked a bit like a set of wings on a normal aircraft, but without a fuselage or a tail. And it was probably equally noisy because it had eight turbojet engines on it. And that aircraft was the Northrop YB-49 Flying Wing. And today I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this aircraft. The aircraft you were looking at was the Northrop YB-49 Flying Wing. Now, it looked pretty impressive when you saw it. And as you can see from the images and videos in this production, it did look extremely futuristic. But um, within roughly a year, uh, the flying program was cancelled and subsequent to that all the various pre-production prototypes of this aircraft were scrapped and none exist today. Um, why was that? Let's take a look in this video. So if you look at many documentaries about these flying wings they will tell you that there was some big conspiracy and that Jack Northrop was abused by the US Air Force and US government and his wings were unfairly cancelled and his hyper machines uh, were held back by four decades out of spite. Unfortunately, although this makes a lovely story, I can't find anything in my research that backs it up, and that's what I want to talk about today. Another point I want to make is that I was halfway through writing the script of this on, I think, Monday this week, when one of my favorite channels, uh, the redoubtable Italian Millennium Seven Star, released a video, there'll be a link in the description, if I remember, there'll be a card here, where in the first two minutes he mentioned many of the things that I'm about to mention here, but I have not copied his video, and I've gone slightly more in depth than he has, but I do recommend his channel, so please go check it out. Again, link in the description. I'll save you watching the rest of this video, and say that the reason that the flying wings weren't produced back in the late 1940s is because the aircraft that Jack Northrop had simply weren't the aircraft that the United States Air Force at that time needed. Jack Northrop was an amazingly clever aeronautical engineer and clearly a man of very, very considerable self-motivation in order to get what he did done. However, he simply wasn't peddling what the customer needed. And we'll look in that in a bit more detail in the rest of this video. All aircraft, as I've said before, are affected by four primary forces. So you've got thrust, which pushes the aircraft, and drag, which holds it back. So for the aircraft to move through the air, those need to balance. Thrust provided by the engines, drag provided by the air. The higher you go, the thinner the air is, the less drag there is. Lift, which is what you need to keep the airplane flying, and weight, which is what you need to keep the aircraft down. Now, there are, in general, two types of drag, parasitic drag and induced drag. Now, parasitic drag is the drag that any object moving through any fluid experiences as a result of its shape and the fact that it's moving through that fluid. So, anything moving has parasitic drag. We can reduce the parasitic drag by streamlining, which is obviously what we do. Now, induced drag, on the other hand, is the drag that is created by the wing surface as it moves through the air in order that the wing can generate the lift that is required. So all wings moving through the air require an angle of attack. That is to say, they move through the air presenting a certain angle to the air through which they're moving in order to generate lift. Now, the lower the speed of the wing, the higher the attack angle needs to be in order to generate the required lift. Meaning that as an aircraft is on its takeoff roll, its induced drag is pretty much at the highest as it takes off because it's got such a high angle of attack um, in order to generate the lift at that low speed. As the aircraft speeds up, the angle of attack can be reduced and the induced drag is reduced. However, as you speed up, the parasitic drag massively increases, meaning that you'll get two lines on a chart 
and the total drag, which is the parasitic drag plus the induced drag, is going to be at its minimum at a certain speed, and that speed will be designed for that aircraft. So, as you know, most aircraft are of the tube and wing design. So you have a long tube or fuselage in which to put stuff, and you have wings which generate lift. You're also going to have a tail which controls what direction the aircraft goes in. Now, the wings will generate your induced drag, the rest of it is going to generate only parasitic drag. Slightly more parasitic drag than you might think because almost all aircraft are set up with the centre of gravity ahead of the centre of lift, meaning that the tailplanes have to push down on the back of the aeroplane to counter that. So engine location and tail appendages and things, you know, they're, they're adjusted in accordance with fashion or thinking at the time, but in general, pretty much every aircraft that's ever built has been on this form. So the classic tube and wing design is simple to build, it's pretty efficient on space, it's fairly efficient to fly with, and it's pretty good all round, easy to maintain and so on, but it does suffer from a certain amount of parasitic drag. Early aircraft tended not to fly very fast. This was mainly due to the lack of power available from the piston engines available at the time. Now, because they couldn't fly very fast and because parasitic drag is quite low when you're flying at a low speed, these aircraft had very high parasitic drag because of the number of cross braces, wires, biplane wings, exposed wheels and so on. As more and more powerful engines were developed, it became feasible to make aircraft go faster and faster, and the faster you go, the higher the parasitic drag, so things like retractable undercarriage were developed. And by the 1930s, you saw that biplanes were largely given way to monoplanes. Most high-powered aircraft had retractable undercarriage. Uh, there weren't many cross-bracing wires. You had smooth aluminium fuselages as opposed to more wrinkly fabric coverings. And all of these led to aircraft that were, by the Second World War, many, in many cases able to fly 400 miles per hour in a horizontal line. So the idea of a flying wing then, it's not a particularly complex concept. It's uh, basically, instead of having all of the fuselage and all the tail appendages and everything else, just have the wing. Put everything in the wing. That, in principle, would mean that you have a lot less parasitic drag and all of the surfaces that you have are only going to generate induced drag since your entire aircraft is a wing. Sounds good in principle, and in principle you may be able to reduce the total drag of the aircraft by up to 10%. So the flying wing configuration, it doesn't take a genius to figure it out. And many people in many countries, Russia, Britain, Germany, France, America, did toy around with the idea quite a bit in the early days of aviation. But today it's most widely associated with one man, that's the aviation engineer Jack Northrop, and the Northrop series of companies that he founded, which still go on today in the Northrop Grumman Corporation. Now, it's fair, I think, to associate flying wings with Jack Northrop, because of course, although he didn't come up with the idea, anyone with an aeronautical engineering degree could do that, and did, he did more than anybody else to realise it, and the flying wings that were constructed by him and his firms were by far the largest that have ever been built, and the highest performing that have ever been built, and the most technologically advanced that have ever been built. Jack Northrop, from 1895 to 1981. He was an aeronautical engineer from America and he started his career at Lockheed and then left to form a series of companies bearing his own name. And although he is best known for flying wings, he also made very significant contributions to aviation in general, particularly with the use of aluminium alloys for all metal aircraft and the use of structural space frames in order to keep the aircraft strong. He created the Greek series of aircraft, the Alpha, Beta, Gamma and Delta. These were very sleek, very advanced aerodynamically and performed very well for their time. So Jack Northrop, undoubtedly very, very good engineer. At some point in the 1920s, he became interested in flying wings and he dedicated the rest of his career as an aeronautical engineer and as a businessman to the development of these wings. So the first aircraft that Northrop flew with a vaguely flying wing configuration was in 1929. As you can see here, it's still got a tail, um, but it doesn't really have a fuselage and the whole thing is kind of encased in one big thick wing. So in 1942, after a series of further development prototypes, the N9M flew. Now this sleek yellow aircraft, of which four were built, 
it has to say was a very successful test aircraft. There were obviously teething problems. Um, its stability was never amazing, but it was certainly possible for pilots to fly it, and they did. Although it looks really sleek and futuristic, and it's yellow, uh, it was also pretty advanced for its time. It had boosted hydraulic controls, for example, and retractable undercarriage, and it got a lot of performance from two relatively underpowered and unreliable piston engines. In order to achieve your control, it had split aerolons. That is to say, the aerolons could open up in half in order to cause drag on one side, which allowed the aircraft to yaw without having a rudder. This is a disadvantage of all wing aircraft in that turning by creating drag on one side is creating drag on one side, and therefore, under certain conditions, your drag overall on a flying wing may be slightly more than a conventional aircraft. However, the aircraft flew very, very well. And you're probably asking, why did it have all these very advanced features for a test aircraft? And I'm going to tell you why. You see, the N9M wasn't just a test aircraft. Jack Northrop saw it as a one-third scale model of a much bigger aircraft that he'd already, by 1942, been contracted to build by the United States Army Air Force. And that aircraft was the YB-35. As a side note, one of the N9Ms was restored later and was flying at air shows until 2019 when unfortunately it tragically crashed with the death of its pilot. Um, however, because of that, you can see many videos of the N9M flying on the internet today and it looked as beautiful in the 2010s as it did when it was first flying in the 1940s. So what had led the United States Army Air Force to hose Jack Northrop down with a couple of million dollars in order to build a gigantic prototype aircraft of a configuration that nobody had really thought about that much at that scale before? Well, World War II, of course. Um, in early World War II, sort of 1939, 1940, the United States was not unreasonably worried that Britain was going to fall, in which case a useful air base from which to launch attacks on Nazi Germany, if America chose to enter the war, because don't forget at this point they hadn't, uh, would be lost. And it would seem that the only reasonable solution would be to take off from America, fly all the way to Europe, unload your bombs over some unsuspecting Germans and fly all the way home. Now, that would have required an absolutely unprecedented range at the time. And so contracts were made for prototype aircraft with both Convair and Northrop in order to develop aircraft with a range that was over 10,000 kilometers at 40,000 feet carrying about five metric tons of bombs. Now, that was an unbelievable specification for the time, but then they added the speed requirements, which was a maximum speed of about 400 miles an hour and a cruise speed of 270 to 80 miles an hour. So at the time in 1941, that was quite a high specification and it was difficult to see how it was gonna be achieved. And for that reason, the United States Army Air Force was prepared to accept a proposal as radical as Northrop's flying wing to do the job. Now, ultimately, of course, Britain didn't fall. So although these aircraft were developed throughout the war, priorities shifted to other things because the need for it wasn't really there. And by the time either of these aircraft flew, the war was dead and gone, thankfully. One of them, of course, came the famous Convair B-36, and the other was the original propeller-powered Northrop YB-35. So don't forget that in 1941, when the contract was initially issued, piston engines were the only practical means of propelling an aircraft. Due to the fact that priorities shifted and production delays occurred, by the time these aircraft were ready to fly in 1946, two very significant developments had occurred. One was the development of jet aircraft, and the other was the development of the atomic bomb. And it was these factors, I think, more than anything else, which led to the eventual demise of the flying wing program. So the YB-35 was a very sleek, very impressive looking aircraft when it first flew on the 25th of June in 1946. Four gigantic Pratt & Whitney piston engines powered four gigantic contra-rotating propellers, which allegedly could push this thing up to nearly 400 miles an hour at an altitude of 10,000 meters, although it never actually achieved either of those things. 
main reason why it was very unsuccessful was because the engine propeller configuration just didn't work that well. There were serious vibration issues. There were contractual issues in who owned the propellers, who owned the engines, who owned the plane. All this took a long, long time to resolve. And in fact, after just 19 flights, the contra-rotating propellers were replaced with single rotating propellers, which had a knock-on detrimental effect to speed and range. And by this time, anyway, it was very clear that jets were going to be the future of aircraft. So the Air Force had already contracted Northrop to convert two of these pre-production propeller aircraft to eight engine jet aircraft. And that's what became the YB-49. The only reason probably that the Air Force were prepared to humor Northrop over this period is that the B-36 was also having its fair share of problems at the time, so that also did not have a smooth development. Now, in order to convert the propeller aircraft to a jet aircraft with the low power jet engines available at the time, eight Allison jet engines were needed and fuel tanks had to be removed in order to fit the jet engines in and then bomb bays had to be removed in order to fit the fuel in where the fuel had been and also the propellers on the propeller version created a certain amount of directional stability similar somewhat similar to a rudder uh, and in order to counter that without the propellers small fins were added which turned it a little bit away from being a flying wing into being a flying wing with fins. Um, I don't think Northrop would have been that happy but it was probably the best solution available. The engineers worked at absolutely breakneck speed making these conversions. It's difficult for us today used to development programs lasting decades to understand how hard those guys worked back in those days and the breakneck speed of technological chains. By the 27th of October 1947, the first jet-powered YB-47 was ready for takeoff, and it instantly showed a lot more promise than the earlier propeller-powered version of the same aircraft. It was much more reliable, and don't forget at that time jet aircraft were very much in their infancy, so it set numerous endurance records for the performance of jet aircraft. It stayed above 40,000 feet for well over six hours, and it had a pretty high cruising speed of pushing 400 miles an hour, which was much higher than the propeller version ever could have had. Unfortunately, the downside of this was that the fuel consumption had completely skyrocketed. So early jet engines were very low powered. They tended to have single spool designs and the temperatures at the turbine weren't that high, meaning the compressor efficiency wasn't that high. So they drank fuel like it was going out of business. The range was reduced to optimistically 6,000 kilometers, but with a bomb load, it was probably more like 2,500 kilometers. So nowhere near what the original specification required. To make matters worse, the second prototype crashed, killing its five-man crew, which was, which was very sad. And this raised questions about the aircraft's stall stability and various other things. As a result of this and some other issues, even though Northrop managed to gain some traction with a six-engine reconnaissance version of the aircraft, the US Air Force cancelled any development orders in 1950. And subsequent to that, all the aircraft were broken up for scrap. Apparently, the cancellation of the Flying Wing project was so demoralizing to poor Jack Northrop that he retired from the industry, retired from his company, and didn't surface until 1979, where famously, in a TV interview, he made an extraordinary allegation that one Mr. Symington, Stuart Symington, the then Secretary of the Air Force, had cancelled the Flying Wing program because he was annoyed that Northrop had refused to merge with their rival Convair Aviation, and that because of that, the wings had been cancelled. Subsequently to that interview, with the unveiling of the blended wing Flying Wing B-2, and more recently the B-21 Raider, which sports a similar wing pattern, it has kind of entered public consciousness that this is the truth, this is what happened, because the B-2 and the B-21 are flying wing, they're very successful, so Northrop was some kind of savant who was 40 years ahead of his time, and his project were unfairly cancelled. I don't really think this viewpoint stands up to anything more than superficial examination. I've conducted a lot of research into this and I have unearthed the following. 
So firstly, by 1948, there was very significant improvement in the B-36 programme. It became apparent that this programme could be made to work and could be made to work relatively easily. The B-36 was an enormous, enormous aircraft. Therefore, when they fitted tip jets to the end of the wings, it boosted its cruise speed to a similar level to what the YB-49 was achieving, but it maintained its range because it still had piston engines and it had extra fuel capacity. So the B-36 was clearly going to be a less troublesome beast. That's the first reason. Secondly, in the fiscal year of 1950, President Truman, who is an underrated president in my opinion, and the last president not to have a college degree, increased, not reduced, the defence budget from about $11.8 billion per year to $14.3 billion per year. This was a substantial improvement in the amount of money available, but it was nowhere near enough money to keep all the programmes that were on going at the time running. So things had to be cancelled, and they were not in a position to keep a programme running just because it looked cool. It's worth noting that in this time the Air Force had to cancel 11 planned combat units and also scrap 11 combat units that were already in existence, and numerous other programmes got cancelled cancelled over the same time, so Northrop was not really singled out in that respect. So thirdly, in October 1948, Lieutenant General Curtis LeMay, bombs away with Curtis LeMay, uh, was appointed as the head of SAC, which was the Strategic Air Command. So SAC was created after World War II in order to be in charge of America's nuclear arsenal. So General LeMay was a requirements orientated man. He knew what he needed to do and because of that he knew that the B-36 was a good aircraft. He was willing to give up other programs if it meant he could get his hands on more B-36s and that's what he did. And the reason he did this was in order to build the Strategic Air Command into a weapon capable of killing a nation. And the nation in question was the Soviet Union, of which everyone was rightly terrified at the time. Now, even then, in the early days of SAC, they only had maybe 130 atomic bombs at the time, but that was still enough to drop two on the 70 biggest cities in the Soviet Union. And in order to do that, he needed reliable aircraft today, not fancy ones tomorrow. Fourthly, what LeMay probably knew, and what Stuart Symington, the then Secretary of the Air Force, definitely knew by 1950, was that the development of hydrogen bombs was going to happen. Now, hydrogen bombs at the time were going to be very much larger than the fission-based atomic bombs. And in fact, the first ones were basically small factories. <laughs> you know, they were like a nuclear installation that you had to set off. The first air droppable version, the Mark 21, weighed eight tons, had a diameter of 1.5 meters and a length of more than eight meters. So there was no way that thing would have been shoehorned into the YB-49's bomb load. And even if it could have been, the amount of fuel they would have been able to carry in order to cart around this eight-ton monster would have reduced the range to just a few hundred kilometers. It, it just wasn't feasible. But the B-36, with its gigantic fuselage and enormous room, easily could carry it. Fifthly, the YB-49 was supposed to be a bomber aircraft. Now, in order to drop an unguided bomb on a target from 40,000 feet, which was the kind of heights they were hoping to achieve at the time, you need to be very, very precise in your bomb run. Now, the YB-49 had what was described as marginal stability in the yaw axis. So it wasn't unstable, but it was not exactly rock-solid steady like the gigantic B-36 was. So it would have needed a bomb run that lasted a long, long time, and even then it was probably only going to get its bombs within a couple of miles of the target. And although early atomic bombs were powerful, they weren't that powerful to achieve the desired effect if they were lobbed on the other side of town. Now, work was ongoing to improve the yaw stability. So various autopilot systems had been developed, which had improved it massively. And contrary to a lot of people, I am very much of the opinion that the electronics of the 1940s actually could have given us the sort of fly-by-wire control system that was required in order to sort this out. But it's fair to say that that would have taken a lot of research and a lot of time. And again, that was a luxury that LeMay and the Strategic Air Command did not have. Finally, the jet-powered B-36 
B-47 aircraft was already on the drawing board and was going to show great promise. Well, <laughs> although it turned out to be a little bit crashy, it was a very high-performing aircraft, certainly much higher than the YB-49 could ever have been because it had a slim swept back wing and six jet engines and a fuselage. Don't forget that the YB-49 had been designed originally as a propeller aircraft with the expectation that its top speed would be a maximum 400 miles an hour. Now we had jet aircraft capable of 600 miles an hour, so there really wasn't much point in trying to boost the YB-49's thick wing to those kinds of speeds. In addition to the B-47, the B-52 was already on the drawing board, so it would have been flogging a dead horse, really, to continue with the flying wing program. And for that reason, I believe that the decision to cancel it was no conspiracy at all. Um, it was just that it didn't meet the requirements of the Air Force at the time. Could it be a failure of sort of customer management? Yes, I suppose it could be. So, you know, in today's late stage capitalism dominated world, we take it for granted that companies form focus groups and they ask people and they interview people and then they identify a niche and then they create a product or service that that customer requires. And this does happen to some extent, but to a much greater extent, what happens is that companies force and advertise and lobby and bully people into thinking that they want something that the company just happens to sell. Now, it's fair to say that Northrop didn't really do either of those two things with his flying wing aircraft. What Northrop did was build something that he wanted to build that didn't really meet the requirements of the customer that he was trying to sell it to. That doesn't excuse the American military from continuously changing their requirements, you know, changing range requirements, changing height requirements, changing speed requirements and so forth. But that was kind of an inevitable part of the development that was going on in the outside world at the time. It's just true that by the late 1940s, good faith or not, Northrop didn't have an aircraft that the Air Force needed. The customer was Curtis LeMay's Strategic Air Command and they needed an aircraft that was long range, could carry a high load and would be stable and reliable. And the flying wing at that time was none of those things and as we have seen, probably couldn't be developed into many of them either. What the flying wing did have was reasonable speed, high altitude performance, very good maneuverability, aerodynamic efficiency and a low space requirement so in principle they could be shoved into a hangar sideways. But none of those things really mattered to the Strategic Air Command and there's no evidence really that Northrop tried to make them believe that those things should matter. He certainly mentioned them in every flying report but he didn't really say why that would be relevant and from my point of view it's difficult to see how they could have been. Even the reconnaissance version that he came up with couldn't really do the job any better than the B-36 and there wasn't much point in having a whole other aircraft with all its infrastructure to do something that could be done by shoving a camera on an existing aircraft. It's also true that even in large organisations the purchasing decisions are often made by a relatively small handful of people and I can't find any evidence to suggest that Jack Northrop had a face-to-face -face meeting with Curtis LeMay at all. And it would have been LeMay that recommended to Stuart Symington, the Secretary of the Air Force, what aircraft to buy and, and what he needed. So even if Northrop had something LeMay needed, which, which he didn't, I can't really unearth anything that says that he met with him to try and get him to buy it. So overall, I think what we have with the Flying Wing program is a 20-year attempt by an absolutely brilliant and visionary aviation engineer to create a product for a customer that didn't need it, whilst failing to really make the right steps to make the customer want it. And because of that, I feel that the decision to cancel these aircraft in 1950 was absolutely a sound one, and I can't find any evidence at all of any sort of conspiracy or any circumstantial evidence that would support that. It's also true that Northrop subsequently received an order for over a thousand of its F-89 Scorpion interceptor aircraft um, and subsequently went on to sell thousands of F-5s and their derivatives and did not go out of business and are still in business today as part of the Northrop Grumman Corporation. So to me that hardly sounds like they were punished by the US authorities. Of course, the Northrop B-2 bomber, which was released more than 40 years later, 
coincidentally has the same wingspan of 172 feet as the original YB-49. And that is a very successful aircraft, albeit very expensive. So why is it okay in the 1980s, and again now in the 2020s with the similar, albeit smaller B-21 radar, to have a flying wing when it wasn't all right then? And the answer to that is just one word, and the one word is stealth. Modern small stealth aircraft, such as the F-22 and F-35, are very, very resistant against detection by high-frequency X-band radars that are found in most fighter aircraft. But they are not that resistant against the long-range air search radars that our Russian and Chinese friends are fielding. With aircraft like the B-2, with its long, straight leading edge, for mathematical reasons I don't understand, they are less likely to resonantly emit long-wave radar back to the source. And for that reason, the flying wing is the only aircraft configuration that we know of that is capable, in principle, of defeating long-range stealth radars. And for that reason, the B-2 and the B-21 are in that configuration, and they are the only aircraft that we know of flying today that can, at least in theory, whether or not it's in practice, I don't know, but at least in theory, defeat some of the L-band search radars that our Russian and Chinese friends field. The other aspects that dogged the original flying wing have long been solved. Turbofan engines today are very much more efficient. Nuclear weapons very, 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 very much smaller. Air-to-air -air refueling means that the range is infinite. Uh, Fly-by-wire and autopilot means that not only is the aircraft stable, but that it can unload the crew over very long missions. So finally, we've got to ask, why aren't there civilian aircraft in this configuration? After all, if the drag's lower, and civilian aircraft is an incredibly cost-competitive environment, surely any reduction in drag would drive this. And we've all seen over the decades, you know, these fancy renders by Boeing Airbus and others of these sleek blended wing type bodies cruising elegantly across the sky. Well, the truth of the matter is that these guys are not stupid either, and their engineers will have decided that the risks of designing it and the benefits of designing it don't really outweigh the ease with which they can continue to refine a conventional tube and wing designs. For example, pressurizing a flying wing is not easy, and it's certainly not going to be easy at a weight that's acceptable. Instead of having a simple tube that's easy to pressurize, you're going to have a sort of bubble shape. Can be done, expensive. You're going to have difficulty getting people out of the aircraft if there's an emergency, and you're going to have problems with fuel entering the fuselage section if the fuel tanks rupture. Um, you're also going to have issues with the physical size of the aircraft, because it's probably going to have a longer wingspan and it's not going to fit exact existing gates. I mean, all of these problems are solvable, but you know, the amount of money that you'd need to spend to solve them versus the potential gain has obviously been judged insufficient by the commercial world. Again, no big conspiracy. It's not engineers sat on their thumbs too lazy to do anything. It's just that the numbers don't work out. None of what I've said, however, takes away from Jack Northrop's intellect, his hard work, his creativity, his persistence, and all of those characteristics undoubtedly led him to create an unbelievable series of very impressive aircraft. And there is a somewhat happy ending for Jack Northrop in that prior to his death, he was allowed back into Northrop Corporation in order to witness the then secret plans for the then very, very secret B-2 flying wing aircraft. So before he died, he did at least get some vindication that his work was going to be put to good use. And we can end it on a happy note. To make this video, I've actually been interested in this topic for years and wanted to make this video for years and never really got around to it. I've read an awful lot. I've read pilot's manuals. I've read books. Um, but the most useful source that I found was a university dissertation by an American Air Force officer in 1984. There's a link in the description. The gentleman's name was Francis Baker. And he wrote this incredible dissertation where he had researched numerous letters and numerous meeting minutes. He had actually spoken to many of the people involved, including incredible test pilots like Bob Cardenas, who was also involved with Chuck Yeager's record-breaking sound barrier attempt. And I felt like it was a very balanced and very 
thorough report. Now, it did coincidentally kind of mesh with what I'd figured out myself, but it does go into a lot more detail than I can go into here. If you want to read it, links in the description. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching and we'll catch you next time. Two, one, clap. Okay, thank you very much, honey. Uh, love you very much. We'll see you at the end.